Yo, 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 peace and love, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Caribbean Cannabis Channel. And as always, we always offer exciting conversations. We always have engaging and exciting guests ex- contributing for different experiences, their own personal experiences. Today, I have a pleasure of having a guest that is holding up one of the main pillars in the cannabis community because without our growers, without our farmers, without our agricultural experts, the cannabis industry would not move anywhere. So I want to welcome our guest for today, Ray, who's out in the Midwest in the US of A. He's going to share with us some of his experiences, some of his tips and lessons, pitfalls that persons could probably avoid. So I definitely think whether you are a personal grower yourself, you just interested in agricultural practices. I think you have a lot to learn from this episode. So sit back as we meditate and we educate. So let's jump into it. Ray, how are you doing today? Dr. Tower guest. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? You're pretty good out there, man. You're pretty good. So you're just telling me about the the rain up in the Midwest. Uh, We're getting rain in the Caribbean here as well. So we do have something similar happening yes we we had several days of rain this is a, a time of year that's a rain season for us um unfortunately with this time of year the rain associated with cooler temps um the winds uh can be increasing with some rainstorm but uh the cool temperatures and the moisture um can be challenging for cultivation uh this this late to the season where uh here in the north woods, most of the thing, most of the trees um, are starting to go dormant. Um, a lot of the uh, underbrush is starting to die off, and you know, so there's uh, it's harder to thrive in this time of year. Okay, uh, I I want to find out more about that because I know in certain parts of the the world or different regions, persons grow according to the climate. So how does growing in the climate of the um, the Midwest vary based on some other places that you may know? Well, so we have uh, four seasons. So we have, um, uh, you know, the spring, summer, winter, uh, so the fall and winter. And with that, um, the growth season is short, um, uh, especially in the, in the north woods, the northern parts uh, of the Midwest versus in the southern. Uh, end of the Midwest. So we have different challenges um, to make it through a short season uh, from from being warm enough to get planted into the ground to being um, staying warm enough to finish harvest in in some of your late season uh, crops that one may plant. Um, So those are the challenges with the varying of the weather. I mean, uh, heat we get heat. We've been this year was this season was a uh, a little strange. I mean, they 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 seem to be um, you know that way sometimes more often uh, lately. I don't know. I can't say for sure, but you know, there's challenges every year. This year we had a very wet season to begin with, with the snow melt, mm-hmm. with the rain, mm-hmm. and it was hard to get planted into the ground because of oversaturation, because of poor temps yet. And then with the short season, um, we run into challenges of whether or not we get enough rain. Um, in in uh, the, the beginning of summer, we had uh, drought pretty much conditions. Um, we, we did get then some rain in, and it made things well. And then, and then August was so-so. And then just this last month, September, um, we had more drought conditions most of the month. I mean, it was only this last five days where we got uh, several oh. inches um, to to get us kind of caught back up. But so those are the challenges. Now with with winter, it's just around the corner. The fall, the fall will be in and out. Fall has just barely started on the calendar, but the leaves have been falling and changing. Mm-hmm. And, and in a matter of of uh, four to six weeks, we'll see our first snowfall. So it's challenging. It can be very challenging. So I'm guessing those climates, those issues will more so affect those who are growing outdoors. How 
how do you adapt if you are not an indoor grower in those particular situations? If you're, if you're not an indoor grower? Plus, that, if you're, yes. okay. you're only outdoor, you haven't ventured yes. into the outdoor growing as yet. Like, how could yes. someone prevent or mitigate a lot of those issues from damaging their crops or unsuccessful harvest? Well, well, um, I, w- I would have to say there's, there's probably several that one can consider and, and, and put into uh, effect. Um, let's, let's deal with uh, Mother Nature and the bug pressure because that right there can devastate a crop. Um, as far as, you know, your sap sucking bugs and your bugs that chew, um, on your, on your, on your crops. So what one can do is one can try to, um, plant companion plants with your crops that are going to be plants that, um, de- basically deter the, the pests or, and Mm-hmm. Um, even even sometimes more beneficial, the ones that actually attract the predator bugs that are do want them close by. So when the when the pests do come in, your predator bugs are already close by and can get right on top of of, of keeping guard, so to so to speak. Um, so so dealing with your uh, indigenous or or your environment, your natural bug pressures that come, you know, and that, and that can vary. Sometimes uh, you see sometimes that the aphids have a lot of pressure uh, and they don't want to go away and they keep going through cycles. And so it's hard to get rid of. Um, and, and it could be mm-hmm. because of what the surrounding crops in the fields are planted with the farmers have rotated crops. And so they may have brought corn closer or they may have bought beans closer and those bring in different types of, of bug pressure closer to to one another's farms, no matter who, to each another farm. Such a range, so many miles. Um, as these farmers shift their crops and as we, um, you know, whether it's corn, whether it's beans, you bring in different bugs. So just being aware of, of what bugs you have to deal with and then planting full plants mm-hmm. to, to bring in uh, predators and then planting trap plants to keep maybe those those bugs that uh, attract a certain plants, planting them more away from your crops to draw them away. So there's dealing with bugs, um, that's big. Dealing with the elements, wind, you know, you can do things like wind blocks. Um, I, I, I want to mm-hmm. get more into that with planting actually perhaps bushes or things of that nature to, if you have a strong wind from say the north uh in my case we we get the strong winds from the west and from the north and and they can be brutal um especially later in the season when they uh, bring I in the tippers yeah so, um you know I, I think one of the one of the big ones that a person has to consider and it's important is what genetics you plant you may have genetics that um, can handle better pressure, um, ones that are more resistant to maybe bug pressure or resistance to, in my situation with late in the season trying to finish a crop, you've got rain, you've got cold temperatures, and that's going to cause things to mold. Um, so you want to maybe look for uh, genetics that have resistance to molds, and, and perhaps in my, in my situation, I get a lot of winds, and and I'm grateful for that because with with the cold temperatures, with the the humidity, or even with the moisture, the rains, the winds are going to help dry things off, so that way it's less chance of mold setting in. But um, your best your best case is going to be run uh, growing, cultivating, working with a genetic that maybe has better resistance. Hmm. So okay. I, not to interrupt you, but I want to find out more about choosing genetics, right? Because I remember I last year I visited a farm and there were varying genetics that they had outdoors. But one of the main reasons why they said they placed, um, especially like seedlings or young plants outside, is so that they could be started to train um, to 
to basically strengthen against the wind so they become yeah. more resilient. If you yeah. don't have um like genetics that are already designed to handle those strong winds, could you like change um through trial and error another genetic into becoming more wind resilient? I think there's um I think there's some things you can do to strengthen the plant, whether it's giving it uh, just more health and, and making it stronger that way, um, or mm-hmm. or and I would say and not or but and um, raising them there in their environments, um, acclimating them and letting them get faced with those elements. However, your crops you're growing, um, if these are uh, if these are fruit bearing plants that put on weight as they fruit and as they further their fruiting and, and go to their finishing, they put on more and more and more weight. Um, even sometimes the strongest plants that normally could handle a lot in the mold, when they have put on heavy fruits and then you get some rain that adds to that weight and then you get some wind and the winds can vary to little to a lot, um, just like the rain can vary to a little or a lot. You start adding all these things, and even some of the strongest plants um, can take a pun- can take a punishment from Mother Nature. Um, but getting back to your question specifically, I do think that there is uh, some value in raising young plants as early as you can into the elements to get them to strengthen up and get somewhat, as you say, trained for what's ahead. Um, you know, at the same time, having experience um, adding the weight of the fruits as they mature, adding rains that are gonna come in and saturate and put on weight, adding some winds, you could lose, I mean, you could lose everything at any point in a hailstorm. You lose some bad winds to come through and wipe some things out. But as your plants fruit and they become heavy and these elements of mm-hmm. start getting more into play and, and so you know, so trellising is probably one of the best things I found. Now, aside from putting out some plants that have good structure, good that can that are bred for holding up because there are differences. There's 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 plants that mm-hmm. because of my land, my area, my terroir, I would not try to even plant because they would take, you know, um, if your environment is mild, maybe you have uh, more opportunity for other um, other other crops that you can grow. But when you have conditions that are a little more on the hard and brutal side. You're going to try to mainly try to pick four things that are going to work better for you instead of uh, maybe trying to train plants to acclimate. I mean, there's value in what you're what you're questioning as far as can can it play a role? Yes, but um, if you can, the best thing to do is not um, try to be uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Go with something that's known to work if you can okay that, that that's smart yeah I, th- I think a lot of the time we we, we try to be we, we are human so we try to bring out our creativity or we try to do something new and different and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't but not all the time as you rightfully said we need to reinvent the wheel so from from that what you just explained in terms of mitigating against the damages that could occur to your plant based on different elements um, around you. From your own experience, what are some of the favorite um, strains or the cultivars that you grew and you saw like worked outdoors for, for you? Well, um, so I have to be um, upfront and let you say that my experience is limited with my, my, outdoor, my outdoor cultivation is limited. Um, I have more experience growing indoor. However, that has been useful for me because I've gotten the chance to see the different plants and how they hold their structures and hold up weight and 
and and I like to put hands on them too. What I am seeing from this season, you know, I have to I have to be choosy because I only have a short span to finish my crop. Um so with that being said, the faster finishing plants in in from what my experience has been, I've seen uh the the structure of the plant is more su- supportive, like like branching that's this way versus versus bowed versus coming out and and okay and allowing a because it allows a different load it allows a different a uh, uh, a different load capability mm-hmm. on the on the um on on some plants uh, more than others obviously um. I've I've seen some variances, but um, one of the things that I look for, um, if I'm able to make a choice, which is what I like to do, is that is I like to look <laughs> for uh, where the where the branching connects to the main branch, and then also the laterals to the to the to the side branches. Um, sometimes the plants you'll find have a big fat knuckle. Uh, not all plants do that. I, I don't, it's, it's, um, when you see it, it stands out because most plants don't, but they got a big fat knuckle and I've seen those plants. I think I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They can hold a little bit, in my opinion, more, more weight. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it always goes back to the health of the plant because you can have a plant that's known to do wood and if it's not healthy, it's got a better chance of failing for you structurally um wow. you, know, you know um yeah. it's it's always it's always um uh, it's trial and error until you find out which one that is and then being a, a cultivator you have to then decide well then that's the one i'm going to stay with i'm not going to try other things and um you know so we we usually like to grow different um fruits we try to grow different fruits instead of just one fruit for the most part um when it's when it's for just your 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 small farm um at least for myself i speak i like to have a little variety but um you know when you when you find the ones that that do well then you try to hang on to them or else make a notation mm-hmm. of what seed to grow again okay that's that's smart that's fair so coming from outdoors so we're switching it into indoors now because I, I think especially with climate change um the varying elements of outdoors i think a lot of persons as well now opting for indoor growing so how how has indoor growing been um for you from from the beginning to to now i know that's uh, that probably is a, a, a lengthy time period but um, i know there's some things we always start off with no, nope, um, that's a fair question. Looking at it, which what we are now? Yes, yeah. Yep. No, nope, that's a fair question. Um, um, in a nutshell, and you know, we 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 all have to start somewhere. Um, where I started, and a lot mm-hmm. of people probably can relate, is I got plastic pots, I got bagged soil, I got bottled nutrients. And, um, you know, I, I put a, a little small, um, closet grow, you know, I mean, it was, I had a little more than a closet, but, um, a small room, nothing, nothing big. Um, and planted a seed, um, along the way and beforehand, excuse me, hey, um, I was already trying to learn um, from other people, from from other information on the internet, to at least have a starting point. But um, I started mm-hmm. growing indoor in plastic pots, in bag soil, with um, bottled nutrients. Um, and to be honest with you, I was living in the city on, on a, a city um, public water. So I mean, there's a lot of chemicals in the water to clean up the water. You know, I mean, there's, there was... I I used a, a RO system to help purify that water, but I mean, you know, plugged into public city water that was chlorinated heavily. 
for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but so that's where I started. And, um, you know, I, I'd have to say that, um, in doing research and trying to learn about just cultivating, I picked up on composting and the importance of composting to, to, to make your, um, own dirt. Um, of course that comes with, well, then what do you compost? And then, you know, does it, does it help to compost foods that are full of chemicals from the market? Um, so you have to be, so then I started learning about how to be selective of what to compost and then sourcing, um, my food so that, and it was kind of so that my soil would be healthier, but in turn, it was helping me to be healthier by going with um, just maybe better foods. So for, True, in, for me, indirectly, yeah, yeah, indirectly. Um, um, my main thoughts though was so that I could grow crops that were clean for myself. That that opened up to just being more mindful of cultivating clean and even getting back to um, maybe trying to be more sustainable instead of shopping other places for food that I could grow on my own, um, whether even indoor or outdoor. So I started in a, in a small space with commercial products, soil nutrients, and started to cultivate. I learned that it would take me about 10 months to a year if I started composting now to maybe have some dirt that I could add to the store-bought commercial bag soil that I had started with. Um, mm -hmm. and so that, and that's where, that's where things um, kind of really, I, I would have to say that was the beginning, even though it wasn't the beginning, that was the beginning because I seen a whole new light of what the, of expressions I've seen a whole new light of expressions that I wasn't seeing um, when I grew with bag soil versus growing with a compost that I was blending into my soil. Compost. Yeah. I was I was adding nutrients. Okay. Um, I want to. Sorry, you could you could go. I was going to ask a question, but I don't want to stop you mid thought. Oh no, it's fine. You go ahead. You're welcome. Yeah. Composting, right? You made yes. mention of 10 months to a year to properly like, have material to, to either mix or use on its own. So is it that you never use compost soil alone or you always mix your compost with um, bag soil? So for, for me, um, it actually went hand in hand with when when I was in the beginning now we're talking see and, and I bring up composting because mm -hmm. I think anybody that's um cultivating anybody that's growing for period whether it's for themselves or someone else but especially if it's for yourself and you're close people um anybody that's cultivating we care if it's juicing strawberries whatever fruiting crops you're growing and consuming they should be composting it should be composting because it it's um it's it's full circle. I mean, it's recycling. It's taking what we would normally waste and it's turning it into dirt that we can utilize and make produce some healthy fruits. And so that's why I bring it up because I think it's important. I think anybody that's considering planting a seed should already have had started composting or begin because even if they are going to buy bag soil okay. initially, they eventually can start adding their compost to what they started with their base. And for me, what I did, and this is what I, as I learned, I started taking my used pots that I ran a crop out of, blending it with more new bag soil, a portion, and then adding a portion of compost that I made, cold, a cold aged compost. That's why I say 10 months to a year. This is, um, uh, just a cold age compost I'm turning and turning and adding foods and carbon so um basically waste turning it into something like utilized but so 
that was that were my original methods. I thought I was doing something good, and I think I mean I think I was. I started seeing improvements in my in my uh, fruiting <laughs> plants, but um, eventually I I learned that there's more value into not tearing up my garden beds, um, not disturbing the root zones to harvest my plants at the base and leave the roots in place so that they could compost and feed the soil so that the so that any type of microbiology that may have colonized can stay colonized and not be disturbed. Um, and I started learning the value by listening to other people and 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 looking at mm -hmm. um you know, I mean, it makes sense. If someone comes tear up my house, I got to rebuild it. Um, if you leave the ground undisturbed, that's uh, true. The roots that remain, see, the roots that you that grew your your fruiting plant hold value, hold nutrients. So if they can remain in that ground and compost, uh, they can feed the microbes that are that are living there, and, and the microbes are, stay undisturbed, and they don't have to. Wow. Okay. I, know, so, so that was. I yeah. never considered that before. Yeah, they they, they call it uh, in the the gardeners call it no, no till, just to not disturb soil. Um, so eventually, when I left plastic pots and went into garden beds, you know, dealing with the indoor situation, um, I built my beds and I left them alone. And, and I have a technique to building them from the ground up, um, but. Um, I don't disturb the soil, you know, I, I don't disturb the soil um, and I try to feed it. Uh, eventually, I am, and I, I started hearing about the value of uh, growing cover crops to um, a living mulch, basically, not, not so much a cover crop as far as I'm concerned, cover crops are crops that you alternate. Um, just the living mulch, just the planting a wild flower seed and some beans and things of that nature that you can allow them to grow to flower and then to actually chop them and drop them and let them like a forest floor um, decompose right back into dirt so that you're giving some organic matter, you're feeding the microbes that are that are living in that dirt mm -hmm. soil. So those are some of the things that I started to transition into do as, as far as practices for my for my soil beds. You know, I see amazing things that can happen in indoor beds. Um as far as, you know, it's you you you're you're taking control of the environment and there can be some nice uh fruits that are uh, cultivated. But um at the end of the day even though the elements can be brutal, um, they definitely can be challenging. Um, but I think the better fruiting option is to grow under the sun because of the quality of fruit. Um, you know, just um, you can you can also grow some pretty bad the full, the full spectrum out under the sun. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I have to admit, there's been times I grew poor quality fruits under the sun as well. So I mean, there's, that's not the, that's not just the mm -hmm. answer, but it's a big, it's the biggest part. I think if I could get the sun spectrum, uh, in the indoor environment controlled, you know, be be nailing it. Um, of course. Okay. First, it's better so, to have to follow uh, up with that with that question in terms of yes, sir. in terms of using outdoors, right? You, you said if you if you could, you would prefer um, outdoors if you have the access to the sun um, year round, like how we probably would have. But seeing as how you you probably primarily grow indoors, what's the closest full spectrum light um, that you use indoors that's closest to the sun? Oh, jeez. Um... Probably, probably not such. A, I don't have probably such a thing. <laughs> well, I blend just a full spectrum LED, some Samsung. Um, they're they're actually um, a little bit older boards that are discontinued. Um, so I don't I don't know if um, you know. There's some benefits. There's some white uh, light and some blue light and some. I think there's even some green on that boards. But um, I blend the HBS 
Um, it, it brings heat to the equation of the environment, but um, the spectrum that I think it adds is worth trying to uh, deal with the heat that it that it creates. Um, it's not a lot of heat. You, you move your if you move your air and exchange it. You, you're, it's not a big worry, but you know, the biggest thing is a it's an energy draw. So at the end of the day, um, mm-hmm. I guess my you know over the years my views on growing indoors has changed. Um, my, my passion's still there. Um, really, but yeah, but I you know just um, I would feel better if I had um, my own sustainable energy like a solar or wind, so that I wasn't drawing energy and, and you know that it's. Uh, trying to be more sustainable if I was going to like continue that way or it's something I've been thinking about uh, over the years it'd be a, a goal for me but um yeah I think it off um as much but um yeah I, I like I, well you know yeah, at the I, end I, of the day I, I like the quality of the resin I like the quality of my fruits from outdoor versus um, indoor cultivation, and no matter what is grown. Yeah, I, f- I feel like a couple growers actually continuously refer to that. Like they they love the accessibility and the convenience of indoor, but they if they could, they would always go with outdoor if they get the opportunity. And well, that that kind of goes back to the organic, the sustainable grow. Uh, it's always better to do so in its natural element because plants originally grow outside, grow under the sun, grow down to the earth. I, I, so I think that everybody in time eventually go, goes back to outdoor growing or loves the effect that the plant gets in, in outdoor compared to indoor. Um, I would have to agree. And then to see um, the difference in, the, in its health, the, the plant's health, um, regardless of what seeds you plant. Um, and, and I'm sure that's associated to being in the ground and being under the sun. So we can do a good job. So, question, right? Um, Coming out from... to replicate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we do try to replicate um, the sun. We try to replicate the natural growing states in our controlled environment because of, of obvious reasons, as we outlined before, the different pests that may come about elements the wind pollen from neighboring farms there's so many other things to consider outdoor than indoor but something that i want to to touch on because we were just discussing it in terms of the use of compost and the quality of what you are feeding your plants uh, if for some reason someone isn't able to compost the um, material that they are eating what is the next best alternative or st- the starting point of probably liquid nutrients you should look for um, when you are growing? Well, one of the things that, you, and I, I guess, you, you know, it, it, it might go hand in hand with composting because you can make your own, you can make your own liquid fertilizers too from, from basically, well, actually it would, it would be a, a little bit easier, um, but at the same time, it's, See, here's the thing. Not only do you have to collect your materials for making compost or making your own liquid fertilizer, you still got to have space for them. So you still got to have space for a compost bin or you still got to mm. have space for a barrel if you want to make your own or a bucket if you want to make your own fertilizer. But if you can't compost, there, you can also make your own fertilizer. That, that's, I mean, that's what I... That's my answer because I, I don't go to, I don't buy liquid fertilizers. Excuse me, I don't buy about um, commercial fertilizers anymore. And so a person's first option might okay. be if they can't have compost, that they're going to want to fertilize. Um, and that's fair enough. You're going to need something. The plant, your, your, your crops can sometimes, if it's a heavy feeding plant crop, it's a heavy feeding fruiting plant. It's compost is not going to be enough. You're going to have to give them. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to give that soil, that plant, give that plant, you have to provide it nutrients. Aside from composting, I make my own fertilizer. It's 
it's referred to as Jadam, JLF, Jadam liquid fertilizer. And I make it from wild flower right from my surrounding environment, from right outside, um, from the from the different any wild type flowers of flowers or the specific season. flowers that you use? Well, so you know, um, you're going to have a fertilizer that you use for vegetative stage, and then you're going to have a fertilizer that you use for your flowering stage. So, to make your veg. Mm -hmm liquid fertilizer you're going to want to collect plants that are in a vegetative stage even long clippings will provide some nitrogen when it was referred to it's not a ferment it's an actual uh, to putrefy to, to basically rot compost and, and and there's it involves a container with some water and then the plant material and then you need some leaf mold um, if you can't find actual leaf mold you can use indigenous soil you can use a little bit of soil off the top surface say from under a tree and maybe under some leaves that's where you usually find your leaf mold is going to be under some leaves but your ground's got to have moisture your, your, your leaves got to have some moisture for that mold to be present a lot of times you're going to have maybe very low amount of leaves or none or maybe the leaves are dry so there's no leaf mold, but you just remove those leaves, or if there are none, mm -hmm. you just go for that first top inch or so of some soil. But you're going to grab that soil, indigenous soil, or the leaf mold, putting it in your barrel or your five-gallon bucket with some flowers, wild flowers, or wild plants, depending on if you're making a vegetative fertilizer or a, or a flowering fertilizer. Um, you know, it's good to make both. But your vegetation and your wildflowers may be very different than what I have available. So mine are going to work just as good as yours. That's true. You're just going to be selective and find ones that apply. So if you're going to be making a vegetative fertilizer, you're going for your wildflowers and plants and grasses that are in vegetative stage. And plants obviously need, that's going to provide nitrogen mainly. But those plants also have other nutrient value, maybe not as much. But then that's where you can be more creative and you can start to customize your own fertilizer you make by adding other plants that might provide more potassium, more phosphorus, or more magnesium, or all of the above. Um, when you get a little more experienced mm -hmm. in using it, you can even blend your vegetative with your bloom with your flowering fertilizer to get a more balanced blend that can provide nutrient to your to your to your garden um and it takes time you know there's it takes time it takes practice it's trial and error eventually you get um out of away from pulling money out of your wallet to buy a bottle of nutrients and you're away from uh any possibility um you know you're, you're away from the less chance of getting bad stuff and that comes with bottle nutrients now let's back up a little bit just like your compost you have to be selective of where you're getting your your starting material from so you know you don't want contaminated material same thing with your making your fertilizer uh your liquid fertilizer you don't want to be using gardens that have been sprayed with pesticides or things of that nature. Um, so, you know, you have to be selective mm -hmm. with your inputs to make sure your inputs are clean as well as starting point. But um, I think for uh, another way to provide nutrients to your plant, to your garden, is, is a good practice is if you have the space, because again, you have to have a barrel and part of the process is gonna bring a little order a little smell more than a little let me not be real light about this it's gonna you're gonna want to be able to provide yeah outdoor <laughs> yeah so um so but but yeah. i'll tell you um you know there is there is one more thing it's real simple a person can do research i've mm -hmm. i learned by doing research but there's an old school technique it's called urine cycling um, again, you have to have urine cycling. 
urine cycling. Um, it involves urine and it involves a process that's not very hard. <laughs> Again, yeah, and and uh, you know if you, if most of these bottle fertilizers, you'd be surprised what's in them. So if you can um, provide a clean urine, at least you know you're starting to. Um, you know that doesn't come right away. That takes a little practice. There's dilution. Uh, there's there's it has to be diluted, or you'll burn your plants. You can kill a whole you can kill a whole garden if you overpower it um, with any nutrient. But it's, um, but yeah, that's so mm-hmm. that's maybe a whole different uh, something to talk about at a different time. But um, there's natural ways, and then I guess that was my point. There's natural ways, there's organic ways, there's ways that are clean. These are these are old these are old techniques. This is not something new. This is the way. Um, what do you think they were using before bottled nutrients and, and, and bag soil? You know. Um, yeah. No, you're and, you're right. Because I, I actually remember, like, not even related to cannabis, but just overall growing or plants. A lot of times when you're growing up and you want to, you want to take a leak, um, somebody may yeah. tell you to go on and um, urine, urinate by a plant or urinate by a tree because you're giving it back nutrients. And uh, you, you never really consider it like that. But as you venture into art, actual agriculture and you learn different techniques, whether it be an old technique or a new technique, you see the similarities or you see where the the idea from something came came from. And it's always interesting learning about the different techniques about growing and what you need to put into a plant and how you need to care for a plant because a lot of the times many people think it's just, okay, I'm going to throw a seed into the soil I'm going to add water, add light, and that's about it. But there's so many different things you have to consider when you are cultivating, especially for yourself or if you are cultivating for others. You begin to think about what's the best practice, what's the most healthy way, sustainable way for for you to grow and for you to consume these plants that you are growing, whether it be cannabis, strawberries, or any other type of, of crop really and truly. So it's always amazing to hear experience from actual farmers, cultivators, because you now could apply these own practices in your own garden to see changes in your plants for the better, obviously. But as, it, as you mentioned, it does come with trial and error a lot of the time. So it's all about being patient while you are adding new practices and to your already existing regime. Very true. Absolutely. And if you don't have the patience to uh, try new things or you don't have the, uh, if you can't accept failure, you know, um, because you're going to have to try and try again. And some people maybe uh, run into uh, worse issues or, or issues right away or issues later, but they all exist. Um, even indoor, you know, you're gonna have bugs. Um, you're gonna have mold. Um, you have to, you know, as once you have an indoor situation dialed in, it can be very successful. However, um, you know, outdoor has a as a natural air exchange, a natural airflow, and 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 that's something that you don't have indoor. So. People, it's more than just go ahead and planting a seed and watering it and providing a little light. Um, you know, there's temperatures, there's humidity, there's air flows, and then, you know, that's just one thing, you know. Um, even even if you had that dialed in, you'd overwater it and it'd cause a lot of problems. So there's, there's not a lot, I mean, there's a lot to talk about in a short time. Um, but what's great is, is there's a lot of information available out there. Mm-hmm. And there is a lot of people willing to share that information too. That's true. So, um, that's that's a that's a great thing to have access to information. So where where would you advise people to to go to um, if they are looking to gain more knowledge about growing cannabis? Um, specifically, I've learned a lot from the internet, but there's a lot out there that can mislead you. Um, for me, it took some time to do a lot of listening to who I can trust 
after trying some things of my own. Um, there's one person that stands out to me. Is uh, he's he's helpful, Harry. Um, he's on Instagram, and he's all he's actually more mm, on okay. cannabinoid education, uh, but he also teaches a lot of different growing, uh, organic growing, and he doesn't necessarily have uh, a podcast. He just goes live a lot, and he used to, he used to have a a Sunday. Uh, education and he does do the uh, now and again on the future cannabis project cannabinoid education but i learned a lot from watching his experiences and, and putting a piece of mind there was a lot of things i was already doing that i didn't realize i was doing that he was teaching others through just spreading knowledge and so it mm -hmm. uh, things started clicking more but um Future Cannabis uh, Project, the channel on YouTube, uh, they have a lot of good um, education, a good knowledge, and a good um, interviews and podcasts, different shows going on um, dealing with the community, the cannabis culture mainly. Um, you know, but um, end of the day, you got to be willing to, to, to put your boots on and put your gloves on and, and just get in the dirt. Um, dig in so you know if you don't take those um really? if, if you don't take the steps to try new things like composting that's a starter I, I i can't push that one enough if you don't have a situation make one you don't have a, a place to put a five gallon bucket with the lid and and give it some time to to put comp uh, uh, things to compost and turn it and you know it um you won't have that reward because there's reward that's going to come with that. Yeah. I mean, you can go buy a bag of compost. Sure. You, you know, if you, if you can't, if you can't make your own then find and source a good place that makes some, because you want to put that into your garden. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. There's a lot of resources now or access to different material really and truly. You just have to be willing to, to be invested into your work to see the the growth of it but there, there's so much to actually yes, talk about and discuss about growing and cultivating as you rightfully said and i don't think we'll ever be able to fit the decades of experience that you have or the experiences that you have learned from others into one podcast episode so we will we, we want to to save save and save for some of the information for our, our next time but before yes, we, we we close, there's one thing I just want to find out from from you, which is what is like your favorite part about interacting or growing cannabis? Um, to be honest with you, you know I, I like the final results, um, but I get a lot of satisfaction out of the growth. Um, I get a lot of satisfaction out of seeing the plant grow, change daily. Like if your plant's not changing daily, then, then you're, mm -hmm. there's some improvements to me. Uh, because I, you know, growth. I like seeing growth. I like seeing change. I like seeing it transform from the seed to the beautiful flowers they become. That's I get a lot of uh, <laughs> yeah, it does I look get a magical. lot of satisfaction out of yeah, and and I and I think it's the the rewards of putting in your effort, you know. So that's probably that's probably what you know. It's rewarding, it's rewarding. It's um, it's it's uh, well, you know, it can be challenging to keep things alive. So to provide life. And uh, I feel in the end, the plant sacrifices its life to provide life for me. So it's, uh, it's rewarding. Wow. Uh, that, that was put like perfectly. Like the plant provides so much for you. So the, one of the best things you can really do is just appreciate the transformation from the seed to the end product, all the way down to the consumption. It's all a part, part of it. Uh, so. Like I, I really appreciate the all of the information, the knowledge and experience that you have shared. Even in my own growth, whether I'm growing cannabis or not, I definitely would 
incorporate so many of the things that you would have shared to, to me, both of what we shared on air as well as off air, because I, I'm always watching your, your stories and I even have um, Helpful Harry as well on Instagram. So like learning from, from you guys who have decades of experience being legacy growers and, and educators yourself, it's always a pleasure having you all share that information because they're gatekeep information. So we, we really thank you in, in terms of sharing that. But before we, we actually close, uh, is there anything that you would like to leave with, with the, the listeners as to their own cannabis journey or just whatever piece of advice or wisdom you have for them? You know, um, all I can really uh, think of that can be generalized or I guess for anybody, but, but more so uh, people that are maybe are interested in starting, is you're going to get out of it what you put into it, if that makes sense. Like, if you go with, uh, you get with, you know, if you go with baked soil, there's nothing wrong with that. Get a good baked soil. Don't cut corners because you'll have problems. A lot of those bags, so much bugs. Mm -hmm. If you're going to buy fertilizers, fine. Don't buy fertilizers that are poisoning yourself. You're, you're going to consume this. People you know are going to consume the fruit. Um, you know, so you, simple, you know, you put, you get out what you put in. It goes back to the reward. You know, the plant's sacrificing its life for our happiness. So let's try to make the plant happy. And the rewards are greater. So just don't cut corners. I mean, there's ways if you can't compost. Well, there's someone that does. Just go find a good source. You know, the the plant's forgiving, so you know, let's try to be forgiving as well. You know, love one another. We're in a bad, we're in a time of, we're in a present day time of a lot of turmoil throughout the world. So I tell everybody, be kind. Mm -hmm. You never know what the next guy's experiencing. You know, and be happy. Grow and be happy. I don't know what else to say. You said you said enough. That that's that's way more than enough because we need more of that mindset. We need more persons saying and teaching that to others because we already have enough turmoil in, in the world and we don't need any more. So you know, whatever you're doing, yeah. put your best into it because whatever you put in is what you get out. Yeah. And that's that isn't even applicable to cannabis alone. That's that's life advice. That that's some great life advice. Yeah. So I, I think they, they would appreciate that. I appreciate that because I that's something I could use in my own life as well as any other person. So we do thank you for coming and sharing all of your wisdom, all of your knowledge, yes. your experiences with us. All. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. See you next time.